This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us and for following Working Like Dogs on Instagram and Facebook. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my co-host is my adorable service dog, Lovey. And we're thrilled to be with you to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today we're going to be visiting with author Rebecca Asher Walsh. And Rebecca is a journalist who specializes in four-legged celebrities. And she's going to be talking with us today about her new book, Loyal, 38 Inspiring Tales of Bravery, Heroism, and the Devotion of Dogs. In addition to sharing these stories of these amazing animals, she's also going to talk with us about the work she does with a high-kill shelter in Manhattan and also about the foundation, Deja Foundation, that she founded, which is devoted to raising funds for the care of rescue dogs. So we've got a lot to talk about with Rebecca, so come back after these quick messages. Sit Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Tired of wasting money on giant bags, boxes, and jugs of litter that don't last? Switch to World's Best Cat Litter, the only litter that lets you use less and get more. World's Best Cat Litter uses the concentrated power of corn to deliver outstanding odor control and easy cleanup. It's lightweight, 99% dust-free, and pet, people, and planet-friendly. It's even flushable. Make the switch to World's Best Cat Litter and save $2. Visit www.saveonworldsbest.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're so excited to have Rebecca Asher Walsh with us today. Hello, Rebecca, and welcome. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're so excited you could be with us and talk about your beautiful new book, Loyal. Oh, thank you so much. What kind of service dog do you have? Lovey is a, she actually looks very similar to the dog that's on the cover of your book. <laughs> she is a black lab. Oh, <laughs> how she wonderful. Has, she has a big head similar to the beautiful dog that's on the cover of your book. So thank you for asking. And I'm, I'm surprised you can't hear her snoring. She's laying right here at my feet, belly up, how she likes to lay and snoring very loudly. <laughs> That is so funny. Black lab owners are the happiest people in the entire world. And they've always told me that they're totally different than yellow lab owners, which is always funny to me. It is, yeah, because my (laughs) retired guy is a yellow lab, and they are very different, the two of them. So I would agree with you. (laughs) So tell us, what inspired you to write Loyal? So I had written the prequel to Loyal called Devoted, which was about extraordinary dogs. And it became very clear to me as I was writing Devoted was that what made the dogs extraordinary was the extraordinary people behind the dogs and how these dogs transformed the people to be the best people that they could be. And I sort of loved this uncovering of it looks like it's about the dog, but suddenly you're talking to people who are telling stories of what they were like before the dog and then the dog comes into their life and how that dog has changed their life and they go on to really change the world in their own ways. So when it came time to do Loyal, the follow-up to Devoted, we decided that we wanted to focus on service and therapy dogs for that reason because the differences that they make are so dramatic. And what I loved the most about this book was my concern going in was that the therapy dog and the service dog inherently suggest that something sad has happened, right? Because if you need one, someone has been through a hardship. It isn't just going to be a happy lassie story, sort of, right. that we hadn't devoted. <laughs> and what was amazing 
in this book is it was one of the most joyful projects I've ever had in my life because every single person in this book, far from being sad, felt transformed by this dog in their life and that they were blessed to have whatever was going on with them that that necessitated this dog in their lives and talked about in all their different ways, in 38 different ways, about really being reborn with this animal. So it was very moving. Yeah, so beautiful. And it, it is so true that that you can, a lot of people look at if you have a disability or if you have something that it's very negative. But personally, I can say, boy, there are some perks and some gifts that you get <laughs> from that experience. And my assistance dogs have definitely been the rainbow in that cloud, let me tell you, because it's just as you said, it transforms you into and increases your abilities in ways that you never, ever imagined with such genuine devotion and love. Well, tell us, how did you select 38 dogs and their handlers to be featured in your book? So I went about it in a few different ways. Some stories I heard about, you know, by doing research, other stories, I made phone calls to places that I trusted or rescues that I knew or service dog organizations. It was very important to me because I'm very involved in rescue work that as many of the dogs as possible be rescued. It didn't need to be something that I hit hard in the stories, but I just wanted to sort of quietly remind people that these dogs in shelters are not throwaway dogs because something's wrong with them. The majority are there because family circumstances changed or they're meant to be working dogs and not pets. So I worked with a lot of shelters. I worked with a lot of rescues and I would call, say, a search and rescue organization. You know, there were some that I know that are wonderful and I would say, tell me about your best dog and your most wonderful handler who went through the program this year. And they would start telling stories. And you know as soon as somebody starts telling a story that that's it. I mean, that's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the images are so beautiful in the book, the photography. So how did you get all these beautiful images? Did you interview most people face-to-face? Or how did you do the interviews and get those images? Because they were all over the world, most of the interviews were actually done on the phone, and the images were largely from the people themselves. I mean, not all of them. Some are obviously professionally taken, but people have wonderful pictures of their dogs, and when you say to them, could you send five or ten that we could just look at for the layout, and suddenly, you know, 50 incredible photographs <laughs> flood in. So that, it's always joyful to watch that happen. I mean, people just love talking about their dogs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I love the pictures because the dogs look so happy in the pictures. You can tell that they're just incredible, incredible animals that are thrilled to be doing what they're doing. Well, and that's something that I think is such an important thing for people who aren't familiar with service dogs to understand is that these dogs love their jobs and they need jobs. And trainer after trainer would say the same thing to me about dogs that they would rescue from the shelter who would turn into the most extraordinary guide dog, the most extraordinary bomb sniffer. And what they would continue to say was these dogs are the ones who they're not meant to be pets because they need jobs. They need something to do. And these are the dogs who, if you go to work all day, you come home and you're frustrated that they've eaten your couch. But (laughs) you put these dogs to work and you let them serve a human and they are in heaven. And I think you can see that in the photographs. I think you can hear it in the stories that these dogs are literally born to serve and it's a different kind of animal. Yeah, yeah, I could not agree more. It's just amazing when a dog really, it's when they connect with their human and get to do what they love to do so much and how that impacts that human is just, it's like lightning in a bottle. I mean, it's just, it's magic. Yeah, it's so incredible to see that. Well, tell us about a couple of the dogs that you include in the book that really stand out in your mind. Well, I have to say that I ended up bonding with all of the dogs and all of the people. I mean, I really, it's like choosing your favorite child. But I can say there are a few that I think are were sort of interesting in that they're not obvious 
service dog. So one that's really extraordinary is a dog named Klinger, who's a German shepherd who was raised in upstate New York at Guiding Eyes for the Blind. And what happened was this is a vet who was a marathon runner and began slowly losing his sight, but he refused to stop running. And he was terrifying his family because he would literally run blind. And occasionally there would be a person who could help guide him. But as he said, you know, the person's kid has a soccer game or they're sick or they just weren't reliable. So he met the CEO of Guiding Eyes for the Blind at a marathon. And he said, why aren't you training dogs to keep company of runners? And so Thomas Panic, the head of uh, Guiding Eyes for the Blind, went back to the campus and they started doing some research and they decided that a German shepherd would be the right pacekeeper because they have an interesting lope that a lab doesn't have. And they trained the first dog who is certified, this is Klinger, to be a training companion for a marathon runner. And, you know, it just brings me to tears that you now have this man who has been given back the gift of being able to run marathons. And he also, by the way, competes in triathlons and Ironmans. And <laughs> Thomas Panic, the head, the CEO of Guiding Eyes for the Blind, who's also blind, described testing Klinger for the first time. And he said he just wept when suddenly there he was running for the first time again since he'd lost his sight. So, you know, that kind of story, I never stopped being moved by that sort of story, which is really just absolutely wonderful. So, you know, that's a wonderful, wonderful dog. And then, I don't know, I love so many of them. I mean, they're all... <laughs> all 38, also, right? <laughs> all 38, they're so wonderful. Um, there's another dog I love named Bandit, who's a great Dane who works at the USO at Missouri taking care of the young soldiers who come through or the soldiers who are there in the hospital. And what I loved about that story was a lot of them were our vets who've been through hard times and don't really want to talk about their stories or don't tell their stories. And and when I said to Bandit's owner, do you think any of these people might be willing to get on the phone and talk about Bandit? My voicemail was filled in 10 minutes with people calling to talk about how this dog had changed their lives and, and suddenly opening up about what they'd been through and why it meant so much to have a dog like Bandit listening to them and listening to their stories. And, you know, again, a dog being that unconditional love that allows these people to turn their lives around. Oh, and then my, the other dog I do need to give a shout out to is Atlas, who's the giantest dog I've ever met in my life. He's a French Mastiff, and he's been trained to be a companion for children in PT. And because he's such a beast, what they can do is they can pull themselves up on him and they can get on a ski as a special harness and they can get on a skateboard and fly down the hallway after him practicing their balance. And you have these mothers who are getting on the phone with me crying, saying, you know, my children used to hate going to physical therapy. They felt so bad about themselves. And now they say, I get to go play with Atlas. And Atlas is really, I mean, when I met him, I could not believe he probably weighs three times what I weigh. He's just a monster, monster of heaven and drool and waggy tails. <laughs> I know. I loved that of Atlas in the book. And I love how you're right. He's so huge. And then he's got that little party hat on. <laughs> he's, I mean, he's enormous. He sat in my lap. And I just thought I'm never going to be able to stand up again. <laughs> well, he just, it looks so, I mean, just so beautiful with the children and playing with them yeah. and so non-threatening, even though he is such a, a huge, yes. gorgeous animal. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, we are going to take just a quick break and hear some important messages from our sponsors, but we have a lot more to talk about with Rebecca and to hear a lot more about the incredible dogs that are in her beautiful new book, Loyal. So come right back after these quick messages. We'll be right back, right after these messages. Stay tuned. Molly, here's your dinner. <coughs> Zeus, that's not your food. Don't let that happen to your precious cat. Elevate your cat's eating experience with the Cat Tree Tray. The Cat Tree Tray keeps your cat's food off the floor and conveniently located on the cat tree. It's the perfect way to eat. 
It's a beautiful wrought iron tray that easily attaches to your cat tree and keeps dogs and other critters out of your cat's dish. A must for multi-pet households. There's a 6-inch tray for large bowls and a 4-inch tray for smaller bowls. Purchase your cat tree tray today. Go right now to CatTreeTray.com. That's CatTreeTray.com. C-A-T-T-R-E-E-T-R-A-Y.com. When I adopted her, she was a mess. Scabs, itching, licking, missing fur, hot spots, a thin, dull coat. So I take the dog to the vet for the standard run-of-the-mill tests and treatments. No results. I hear your advertisement on the radio. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. 859-428-1000. So I get the five-pound box of Dynavite and the Lico Chops within a four-week total. Instead of a German Shedder, I have a German Shepherd. Sheba is a 105 lean pounds of shiny, smooth, happy dog for life because she gets fed Dynavite. And the results, they're just incredibly outstanding. And she loves it. When you rescue a dog, you have to do the right thing. You've got to feed him right for life. Do the Dynavite. <gasps> Dynavite for life. 859-428-1000. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E oh. dot com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. <laughs> dot com. <laughs> Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio, and we're so happy to have Rebecca Asher Walsh with us today, and she is an author and talking about her latest beautiful book, Loyal, that is highlighting 38 stories of incredible dogs, and before the break, Rebecca, you were sharing some of those stories with us, and I was hoping you'd share some more. I know one of the dogs that you interviewed and you highlight actually was working after the aftermath of the tragic shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary in Connecticut. Can you tell us a little bit about that dog? Yes, this is a beautiful, beautiful dog, a a beautiful woman. You know, again, we go back to it's the dog, but it's also the people behind the dog. So this is this wonderful, wonderful dog named Drago. And what this woman did is she lived nearby Sandy Hook, and she heard that this had happened, she got in the car with Drago, a Spinone Italiano. They look, I'd never seen one before, and that's why I don't know if you know what they look like, but they look like poodles yes. on crack. <laughs> I mean, it's just it mixed so with a mutt. It's the weirdest looking dog. And she just knew that she had to get there, and she got there, and what they, they had set up tents. And so what started to happen was that Drago could keep the children company while the parents met with a social worker or Drago could keep the parents' company while they met with the social worker. And because people just automatically would relax around a dog, and it just helped the tragedy. And I spoke with a teacher who was there. It was the only interview I've ever done that I had to stop because I was crying so hard that I said, you have to excuse me for a moment, because she was the most amazing storyteller bearing witness to what had happened. And she talked about, so Drago's owner began to bring Drago every single day for the first year of school. And this teacher talked about this this small, small community where everybody knew somebody who had been lost. And this particular teacher had a boy in her class whose sister had been killed. And she talked about standing there. They had something like two or three days off between the shooting and the next day they had to go back to school. There was nothing. And she talked about how the teachers were standing in the hallway and they were near tears because the buses were pulling up with the children for the first time after three days. And they did not know how they were going to teach these children. They didn't know how they would get past their own trauma. They didn't know how they could help the children. And then she described that the dogs and Drago walked in and she said, suddenly, Everything changed, and suddenly we felt like we can do this. And so Drago went every day, and he would sit, and he would be with the children while they read, and he would dress up his owner, very, very funny, and dresses him up, and his 
dog's sister up who would also come in in ridiculous outfits, whether it was for St. Patrick's Day or for Halloween, and just make the children laugh. And, and the teacher was very upfront, although the owner wouldn't have said this, that he's so ridiculous looking, just even without the costumes as a dog, that just walking down the hallway, people would start to smile and laugh. And, and this sense of levity that this dog could bring to what was the worst year in any of their lives. And at the end of the story, what the teacher told me that I loved was almost every single teacher who worked with Drago ended up adopting their own dog by the end of the year, thinking that they too would turn their dogs into therapy dogs. And in fact, the dogs have just ended up being their own therapy dogs, but you know, inspired a whole rush of adoptions. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I know the, the work that therapy dogs are doing after these tragic incidences are just it's amazing it really is and I think we're just really learning the impact that dogs can have in these horrific situations but it's just so beautiful to see the impact and yes the look of Drago is hysterical I mean just (laughs) (laughs) yeah you can't help you can't help but gravitate toward him he's so cute and I know his owner takes him very seriously and I try to too but I kept looking at his pictures (laughs) thinking I just can't I did. <laughs> I know. Well, the picture of him in that little tuxedo was just so adorable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Too cute. Well, that's so inspiring and just incredible. Well, and I also love that you had a story in there about sheep dogs. So tell us about that because we forget those are some of the original working dogs. So tell us about, about those two. Well, these are very, very special sheep dogs. There is an island off of it's in New Zealand or Australia, I can't remember at this point, far, far, far away, where there are endangered penguins, the last of the endangered penguins, and the foxes kept coming up and killing them. And they couldn't figure out what to do about this. And finally, a farmer, this is this tiny island, it's, it's off of Victoria in Australia, and finally this farmer, a chicken farmer nearby said, well, you know, we have Marema sheepdogs who protect our chickens. And this is a very particular kind of sheepdog where they're not particularly bound to people at all. But what they do is, this is very odd and funny, they bond with the chickens. They therefore, when the foxes come around to eat the chickens, they chase the foxes away and they protect the chickens. So the farmer said, well, I don't see why the Marema sheepdogs couldn't protect the penguins. And in fact... This is, so they were brought in because at the worst moment of this, they had lost 360 birds in two nights because of the foxes Mm. who would walk over a little spit of land from the mainland when the tide was down. And since they started with these sheepdogs, they haven't lost one because these sheepdogs are completely bonded to these penguins. And the minute any threat comes in, they surround them and chase them away. But it's a very funny... So these dogs, they're called Yudi and Tula, but in fact, those are just their stage names because they became so popular and had a documentary made about them that people will come on boats and start calling their names. And the caretaker wanted to make sure that they were never distracted. So they tell people that those are their names. So people are off the coast yelling, Yudi, Tula. But in fact, those are not their names. So they don't turn around. Um, And they live, I know, and they live on this island. And when they retire, they're going to go back to the tiny, tiny little town where they're going to live with some chickens at the historical society. And a new one will come in, but it's worked out absolutely perfectly. I love that story. <laughs> That's awesome. How you funny. can protect your friends. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and you exactly. worked with National Geographic on this book, or they were the publisher for it? So I worked with National Geographic. National Geographic is the publisher, but it's distributed through Random House. So this is okay. the second book for National Geographic. And the third book in the series called Love Unleashed will be out next March. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I was going to ask you what your next project was. Yeah. Yeah. So can you give us a little snippet about Love Unleashed? Love Unleashed is more or less more of the same. Just wonderful, wonderful, joyful stories about great dogs. And again, you know, a quiet concentration on as many of them being rescued as possible because their stories are always dramatic and wonderful. And I love the before to happy ending after of those tales. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us about your work because you're the founder of the Deja Foundation. Tell us, what does the foundation do? What's its purpose? 
Sure. So I, um, for close to a decade, have been a volunteer at a high kill shelter in New York, where I live, and it became very, very frustrating. It becomes very frustrating because you know you're looking at heartache sort of all of the time, but you're also there are so many problems because the dogs are only there for let's say three or four or five days before they need to get out or they're at risk. And adoptions can be very fraught because the dogs are coming out generally quite sick. They get kennel cough very quickly, and then that can turn to pneumonia. And they often aren't trained. And what we were seeing was that it was a rough way to start out adoptions because somebody comes into the shelter and they feel, and they are doing something incredibly important and wonderful, and they are saving a life, but they don't realize that there's also generally a great deal of work ahead of them. And it's very difficult to have a bond with a dog that you've rescued when the first two weeks you're suddenly out, you know, $1,800 in vet bills to clear up pneumonia or it turns out the dog isn't house trained. And we just kept seeing things come up that made it more difficult for adopters than we felt was necessary as they were talking to us on the phone. It was as if they were suddenly parents to newborn children. You know, it was just constant needs and money suck and training suck. So we started Deja Foundation. And what we do is we provide grants or scholarships to people and rescue organizations that we vetted who pull dogs off the youth list to fund training and to fund vet bills. So we'll pay the veterinarian directly and we pay the trainer directly. But what that does is it allows the adopter or the rescue to really concentrate on just bonding with that dog and loving that dog and not sitting there thinking, I don't have money to go on a vacation anymore thanks to you or why aren't you house trained? So we just arrange everything for them and then finance it so they can get on with their job of loving the dog that they've rescued. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, because people, a lot of people don't realize the commitment and the responsibility. And like you said, when you bring a dog into your home or an animal that is in a crisis situation, you know, which they've been being in shelter and, right. and are having all kinds of issues. Yeah, that can really be overwhelm, overwhelming. And then they end up taking an animal back. So right. that's so wonderful that you're well, doing Well, and you that. know, I mean, it doesn't even have to be that the dog is coming from a shelter. I mean, you know, from having a service dog, having a dog is a huge responsibility and it can be terrifying, right? I mean, if you suddenly feel that you're on your own with that dog. So it's really lovely to have an organization behind you or volunteers behind you or somebody that you can call and say, help, I've forgotten how to do this or the dog doesn't seem to remember this. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I know. That's what I always tell people. People always say, I want an assistance dog. And I'm like, do Mm -hmm. you really? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. You know, because it is such a commitment, like you said, and and it is a big responsibility when you bring an animal into your, whether they're a working dog or not, it's a big commitment. So how do people get access to support from the foundation? We're at DejaFoundation.com online, and we do private fundraising and people just word of mouth. And then we also are available to really help anybody who needs help and assistance once they've adopted a a rescue dog from a shelter. Or we will also get calls from vets asking for help or from rescues. And the rescues have to fill out quite a long form because we want to make sure that the rescue is a responsible rescue. Mm -hmm. So we're very careful about where the money goes. But we give away 100% of it because we're all volunteers who do other things. So it's very nice to be able to do and be of help. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Excellent. Well, I know our time is coming to an end, but I wanted to ask you one last question about the book. Mm -hmm. And that is, out of all the stories and all that you're sharing and educating and creating awareness, what do you really want the reader to take away from Loyal? I would love the reader to take away that we are all capable of so much more than we are aware of. And sometimes it can be as simple to learn that and realize that as looking at the dog at your feet. And it's something that we should hold close. The joy is around the corner, that nothing is as hard as we think it is, as long as we can stay connected to things outside of ourselves, whether that's other people or, in my case and your case, a wonderful, wonderful furry companion. 
Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's a beautiful way to end our show today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. We really appreciate Thank you, you being so with us. Thank you so much for having me. Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we look forward to Love Unleashed. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I'll talk to you next March. Okay. We look forward to it. We'll, we'll hold you to that. Yep. That sounds <laughs> okay. great. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. And thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We so appreciate you. And we love hearing from you. So please let's stay connected and keep your comments or ideas for future shows. We love to hear that also. And you can email me and Lovey at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. And you can also follow Working Like Dogs on Facebook and Instagram. And we're having so much fun connecting with you on Instagram. So please keep your photos coming. We love seeing photos of your working dog and the incredible work that they're doing every day to support you. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being with you again soon. Take good care. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.